Hi, this is the Social Jello with Angelo show. My name's Angelo. I'm a social scientist, surfer, martial artist, and a whole lot of other things. Coming to you live from Kasai City, Japan, the Social Jello with Angelo show. What's up? And welcome to Social Jello with Angelo. I'm here with、uh, the Kaju Kembo historian, Mitch Powell.、Uh, Mitch! Mitch? Before I even go, so for those of you watching, this is part of a series of a QA, QA with,、uh, with Angelo, about a question that one of my listeners had about Kaju Kembo and the different methods. But before we get to that question, now I have to address another question.、Oh, I didn't tell you about this one, Mitch. <laughs> nah, but I'm going to blindside you anyway. There you go. <laughs> Throw your best shot. It's actually not that bad. Someone else asked me, they said,、uh, while I was answering this question, they're like, you know, When you did the, the Gaylord episode, I really wish that someone, I wish you, not someone, I really wish you would have gone into a deeper dive. He, usually, he literally used the word deeper dive into the history. And、uh, I didn't really respond much to it, but I'm going to respond to that right now. Well, we're doing the QA with Angelo. I'm here with Mitch, who is the official KSD a historian. And if you ever want to hear more of a deep dive, just, you know, Ironically enough, the name of the podcast <laughs> that Mitch and also Glenn's still on there too, right? You and Glenn are,、yeah. are doing the. And if I, if I, if I remember that, and I'm really bad at the names and I'm probably going to fuck this up, and I always say that, those are my, all my disclaimers. It's called the、uh, KSDI Talk Story, right? Talk Story. You got it, man. You hit、okay. a home run. Talk Story. Nice. There it is. Where they actually do a deep dive. Into the history because, KS, because、um, as I mentioned earlier, Mitch is the official KSDI historian. So he's got, all, he's got access to the secrets of the universe. Well, maybe I exaggerated a little bit, but he does have a lot of access to the Kaji Kembo history. So,、um, so before, without further ado, here is the question that this episode is going to cover.、Um, this is coming from Aromatic Illustrator from Reddit.、Uh, thank you very much to the people who are positive on Reddit. Usually it's a lot of hate, but this guy was pretty cool. He says, Hello, I just started training in Kaju Kembo here in Southern California. I am 45 years old and have a black belt in judo. I am curious, do you have a video explaining what the difference is between the Emperado method, the Garcia method, Tumpai, Gaylord method, etc.? What makes each of these styles different? Is one better than the other for true self defense? I'm just going to grab this and just hand it over to Mitch and let's see what Mitch has to say. Well, Angela, I think the first thing you got to do is, is look at where did it all come from? So that takes you all the way back to what we would call the Imperato method. Because, you know, Kajikema was created from the Imperato family. So let's define first what the Imperato method is. And for those that maybe are not all that familiar, some of the stuff I say might need more explanation later on. So please. You know, send a text kind of like this gentleman did. Send a text, send an email. Let us know what part that maybe isn't explained right. But, or, you know, an explanation here the Imperato method is the, it's the original hardline Kempo karate that Adriano and Joe Imperato、uh, taught in Hawaii. So it's the techniques and the forms that they, they put together and they taught to their students. So, In order to, to kind of understand what that means, the art has two basic、uh, like、phases of development. Most people who read about Kaji Kimbo, they know about the 1947 to 49 time period. You've got Adriano Imperato, you've got Joseph Hulk, you've got Peter Chu, you've got Frank Warnez, you've got、uh, George Chang, sometimes called Clarence, getting together and coming up with some self defense techniques. That part a lot of people know, and they even think that's actually all there is to Kaji Kimbo. They think it all happened in those two years. And we know through our history and, and through interviews and such that there's another phase to this. And so the next phase happens in 49 because that group disbands. And in 49, Adrian a m p r a d o he gets his black belt from William Chow. So he starts teaching a group of students of his own over in Haliva Housing, which was the veterans' housing where Imperato lived. 
So and just, I don't want to interrupt you, but just to clarify yeah. so far in this story, that original group that many people talk about that history and they don't always know the names. Like I'm going to clear, I'm going to throw that out there right now. When I heard this story, when I was coming up and I was trying to figure out what Kaja Kimball was as a white belt, um, I just knew as Rob Roland put it, there were five masters <laughs> from, from, from like, the, as you know, how things get with legends, right. right. By the time it gets to me, like five, six generations later, there were these five masters that got together from, from each, from different martial arts styles, from judo to karate. And they were working on these styles. So these are the guys you're talking about when they talk about these legends, um, yeah. the Clarence, and you were mentioning those names. But yeah. what you're seeing right now is that group broke apart. Did I, is that? Well, they went separate ways because okay. the military uh, was, you know, doing the Korean War stuff now, and some of them were in the military. So they were no longer five guys trying to train together. They'd gone off. Joe Hope went off, and uh, and Peter Chu went off, and so they're not around. And Imperato's still there. He had already been in the military. Imperato went in the military. I think it was uh, December '44, uh, something like that. '44, '45. Yeah, maybe it was '45. No, it was '44. He went in the military relatively early. Um, so he had already done his military time. So he's still on the island, and now he's training people of his own, right? But he's got two things going on. He's got his private students, and he's still a student of William Chow. He's still learning Kempo from William Chow, along with his brother, Joe Imperato, who's also William Chow's student, right? So when you get into this 49, this time period, he's got his own people. He's teaching. He's training people. And then according to the records we have in 52, in May of 52, Imperato starts teaching at the Palama Settlement Gym. So the Palama Settlement was a like a rec center that people could go to and, you know, generally a low, con low income area. And they had a gym there. And in that gym, they had boxing and they had judo and they had kempo. So Imperato goes over there and starts formally teaching. Now he may have taught there sooner, but our records show formally May of 52. That same year, he promotes his brother, Joe, to black belt and Joe's his assistant. So you get through the, the beginning of the first school. This is the very first temple school under the Imperato, Imperato brothers. And Joe gets his black belt. So now he's a black belt as well. And you got to keep in mind when Adrian Imperato got his black belt in 1949, there were not very many black belts in Hawaii. I mean, Matosi, uh, Thomas Young, William Chow, uh, maybe McCandless, there's only a handful of people with black belt in Kempo. So that was kind of a big deal. Now, Joe, in 52, he's got his black belt as well. So when Imperato starts teaching over there at the Paloma Settlement Gym, Woodrow McCandless was already there. Woodrow McCandless was a student of the Matosi line. He was James Matosi's student. He also trained with Thomas Young. He also trained with William Chow. So he's got a class over there, and he's actually representing that group. As time goes on, McCandless disbands his class, merges his group with Imperato, and becomes an assistant instructor under Imperato. So uh, all of this will make sense here in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, as this group is doing what they're doing, which is teaching this Kempo, they also start adding some forms. So Joe Imperato and Adriano Imperato are creating martial arts forms. According to uh, Grandmaster Grant Fraticelli, who's part of the KSDI, him and, and Kimo Imperato Smith run the KSDI organization, they have access to all these old documents. And through Imperato's notes, we know that it's about 1955, and they create what they call Palama Settlement Exercises. Those become the forms. They get changed to uh, the name of Pinyon, and then later on, Imperato says, hey, I want you to call these Palama sets because they were created at the Palma Settlement. So you've got techniques being created in that first way, that first phase. Now the Imperato brothers are together and they're together for about seven or eight years. So there's a high probability that they're also creating techniques. We know they create forms. Uh, Adrian Imperato explains that, uh, tells John Bishop and tells other folks, yeah, my brother and I, we created these forms. So, you get uh, 
you get forms now and now it's time to promote people. So Marino T when I gets promoted to black belt, 1955, he's the first student under Emperor to go from white belt to black belt. From that group, you've now got uh, kind of the establishment of the first group of instructors. You got the two Imperato brothers, you got uh, Woodrow McCantless, and you got Marino Tiwano, right? Because from them, they're the ones that are sharing this knowledge. Whatever knowledge they have at that particular time, they're sharing that knowledge. It's Kempo based. And in 57, we have some documents from the Wahiwa School. They're dated September of 57. And then we have newspaper articles from December of 57. The name Kaju Kimbo is used for the very first time, as well as the Kaju Kimbo Self-Defense Institute, as, as far as first time in public. Okay, so we know that name was created back in the 47 to 49 time period. They just weren't using it as far as the name of their art. So now we're up to 57 and we have Kaju Kimbo. So it's got its name, it's got some forms, it's got some teachers, and then Joe Imperato is killed, 1958, May, May 30, 1958. So Joe Imperato, uh, his death, we're not going to go into because we discussed this on other podcasts at length, right? But I'm just going to say that he never got to see the success of Kaji Kimbo or the success of the people that he helped train. And I wanted to put all that in perspective because that takes us to what was the curriculum that this first group of teachers learned. And so I want to share this part. I did an interview a couple years ago with Senior Grandmaster James Roberts. He was trained by Imperato. He was originally at the Waiwa School before the school even went to the YMCA. And his fellow students are Aleo Reyes, Tony Ramos, Richard Takamoto, the folks that would go on to teach Kaji Kimbo, the first wave of teachers, right? Those were his fellow students. So I talked to him at length. He answered a lot of questions. Al Sadler is friends with John Kanahailua's grandson. And through the grandson, I forwarded a bunch of questions and, and I was able to get all of those questions answered. And John Kanahalua was from the Kalihi School under John Leone. When Leone left in 58, uh, John and his brother Jim assisted in instructing at this school until the early 60s when it finally closed down. And then my teacher, Senior Grandmaster Joe Davis, he's friends with Senior Grandmaster Henry Mandek. Henry Mandek was an original Palma Settlement student on the Imperato. So through those guys, through other interviews and so forth, we know the curriculum that was taught, that was considered to be Imperato method, was 11 punch counters, 11 grab counters, some multi-man attacks, some knife and clubs, and about seven forms. So until the 19, like later part of the 50s, that was the whole Imperato method. So I, I, I point that out because a lot of people think Kaj Kimmel was created like 47, 48, 49. It, it wasn't. This is a decade later, and they're still putting the pieces together. So sometime after this period, Adriano Imperato creates 26 advanced punch counters that he calls alphabets. So we're not even to 1960 yet, and that's the curriculum. That's what these guys know. Right? So we, we've, we lay the foundation. We talk about where it came from. You have the first group of teachers uh, or creators. I should say founders. Then you have the second group that does the creating of the forms and puts it all together and teaches the first wave of students. So while all this is going on, I'm just going to pause you real quick because I have one question about, <clears throat> and this is going to kind of address uh, his question about self defense. And I don't, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if it's the true self defense one, but as far as the differences in the self defense, uh, you were saying right now they created 11 punch counters, 11 grab counters. Now, you said after this point, he created the ABCs, which are, which are 27 punch counters. Are these 
26? Yeah, 26 20. letters in the alphabet. Okay, 26, sorry. So these 26 punch counters, are these in addition to the original 11? Yes. Okay, that's what I want to know. All right, cool. No, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> okay, so where we're at now is we're looking at the Kempo that was being taught that became known as Kaji Kempo. Where was it being taught? Well, you had the original school at the Palma Settlement, and that was Adriano and Joe Imperato. They taught there as it moved into the middle 50s. It was primarily Joe Imperato, from my understanding. He had a school at Kaimuki, and that school was initially um, under the direction of George Seronio. They called him Polly Seronio, but George Seronio was his name. And his student, primary student, was uh, Charles Gaylord. So you'll hear Gaylord Method. This is who we're talking about. This is great grandmaster Charles Gaylord. He gave uh, credit to George Seronio as being his chief instructor. So I asked uh, great grandmaster Gaylord, who was a friend of mine, um, I had asked him years ago, I said, well, when Seronio wasn't teaching, who was teaching at the Kaimuki school? And he said, Aleo Reyes was. So you'll, you'll hear a lot of similar names at these schools. The next school is the Wahiwa school, which I think opened in September of 1957, at least based on the records that I have. And the instructor was once again, George Seronio. At that time, Seronio had an assistant instructor, Tony Ramos. So now you're starting to hear some familiar names, Charles Gaylord, Leo Reyes, Tony Ramos. They had a school at Kalihi, and that was John Leone's school. I believe they started in the park, then they went to John Leone's girlfriend's house for a short period of time, and then they had their own school. Uh, Leone taught there until 1958. And you can do a complete deep dive into the whole Leone branch just by talking to uh, great grandmaster uh, Carlos Bunda, because that's his teacher. Right. I, I've had the opportunity uh, to be able to ask him questions and speak with him about his lineage and John Leone. And that's a whole nother story about the early development of Kaji Kimo. But you also had a school in Hilo. Uh, Norio Yamaoka was the instructor at the Hilo school. And in September 58, he was replaced by George Seronio. So Seronio taught at Palama, he taught at uh, Kaimuki, then he went over to Waiwa, and then he started teaching in Hilo. These instructors were moving around. In Aea, Benny Madero was over there, and Madero taught people like Tony Lissette, Joe Habuna, Philip Docio. There were, there were all these schools, there's like 12 of them. These are the only ones I have identified right now, but there were other schools. So the question is, what were they teaching in those schools? Were they all being taught Imperato method? Was one the same one in every school? Was number two the same in every school? Was form one the same and so forth? Okay, because now you know you've got all these schools. That means there's teachers at other than the Imperato brothers. So if you're trying to figure out what was being taught, it was like, well, were you learning directly from them? Or were you learning from one of their students? And I do want to point out that not all of those folks teaching were black belts. Many of them were even purple belts and blue belts and, you know, green and brown. They weren't black belts. When, when John Leone left Hawaii in 58, he was still a brown belt. Uh, I think Tony Ramos, Leores, they were all, they were all color belts when they left Hawaii. They got their black belts after they left. So, the, the school was growing so fast that Imperol didn't have enough black belts. And these students were all coming up and they had the opportunity to teach while they were colored belts. So from the first schools, you've got all of these different dynamics going on. You've got the Imperados teaching in different schools. You've got their students teaching in different schools and the students are learning from all of these folks. Um, you also had Tiwanak. Um, Reno Tiwanak, who was Imperato's first black belt, he had his own group of students. I think as early as probably 1952, 53. I know uh, Benny Luna was probably a student under him in maybe the early 50s, 52, 53. 
So what was he teaching? Because here's where things get like almost confusing. As, as this art of Kaji Kimo is being created, it's going through the 50s the entire time. New things are being added. Things are being refined. Forms are being added. I'm sure they're being refined and changed and modified. As those students are learning, the knowledge is changing. So if you're the guy and you leave it in 1958, but I stay till 1959, I'm, I'm another six months, a year after you, the stuff's probably different. So what I get that's Imperato Method is going to be a little different than what you know is Imperato Method. Uh, I do know that they kept notes. Leo Reyes was his secretary, and he had to write everything down. And they were supposed to make sure all the schools did everything the same way. And at this point, there's only the Imperato Method at this point. That's all they know. Nobody okay, has so, any other methods. So, so <laughs> just to make things very confusing, right? So we're not even like into the present where we actually distinguish different methods. What you're saying is, while we have this thing called the Imperato Method, people are all already adding their own flavors to the Imperato Method. Is that? Well, I don't think they got the flavors in there yet. I think we're too early. <laughs> right. I think that the only guy that maybe had his own little flavor at this point in time, I would think, would be uh, Marino Tiwanak, because he's got his own little, you know, group, and then. Of course, each instructor had has their own way of doing stuff, right? So I'm sure like Benny Madero was probably not teaching exactly the same way as John Leone because what other influence did they have? You know, Madero was a boxer, right? A lot of these guys were boxers. So their ring fighting experience is going to change the way that they would, you know, introduce and teach stuff. So when you think of black belts, and, and the whole beginning of all this, you know, everybody knows Joe Imperato was the first black belt. Um, Marino Tiwanak was the first guy to go from white to black. So he's actually the second black belt under Adriano Imperato. Uh, according to John Bishop's uh, interviews with uh, Adriano Imperato, uh, I think Vernon Chong is next. Uh, then Imperato says it's Walter Lee, then Benny Madero, then George Sheronio, then Sid Assumption. Uh, I think a few years back, uh, Jerry Scott and Clarence Luna interviewed, I believe, Walter Lee, and he said that he was actually a brown belt, never made it to black. So very few guys will ever tell you that. Yeah, no, I didn't make it to black. They'd say, yeah, I was uh, 10th degree, right? Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. But that's like the first group of black belts. And from there, that probably takes us up to 58-ish, right? So. When we this will help us define the different kinds of Kaji Kimbo, but you go through the first generation of instructors. Most people look at John Leone, Tony Ramos, Leo Reyes, Charles Gaylord, and Joe Habuna as like being the first group of instructors. They're the ones that left Hawaii, went to the mainland, started teaching schools. Leone went first, he went out to LA area. Tony Ramos went to LA and then moved to Fairfield, California. Leo Reyes went uh, over to uh, the Northern California area, Charles Gaylord, Bay Area, Joel Buna, Bay Area, and they start teaching schools. But the reality is, if you look at all the students that made black and beyond that came out of that 50s era, there's a lot, there's like 25 names that could be considered Imperato Method instructors. Tewanak, Leone, Medeiros. Soronios, Asuncion, Ramos, Reyes, Gaylord, Albuna, Lisette, Godin, James Roberts, Ben Kekuma, Jaime Vasquez, Curtis Ryan, Herman Wiedemeyer, uh, Henry Mandak, Johnny Gaspang, Richard Takamoto, Mousy Hikalea, Victor Gascon, Abe Kamahoho, and even Clarence Luna, who was able to train uh, from, directly from uh, Adrian Umbrado, who's his stepfather, right? All of these people have Imperato method knowledge and can teach that to their students and share that with their students. But every step away from the Imperato brothers means that the knowledge can be different. So the knowledge taught in each one of these schools or through each one of these instructors can be a little bit different. Now, as uh, 
as this stuff is being taught, if you're not learning it directly from the Imperato brothers, if there's someone between you, just know that there could be some differences. And even if you were learning from the Imperato brothers, they were modifying and adding to and creating Haju Kimbo. So what they taught in 56 was not going to be what they taught in 57 or 58. You are, it, was, it was constantly evolving and growing. So there's going to be differences no matter what, right? So now me, let me take you to where I believe a line was drawn in the sand. In the later part of the 50s, Adrian Umbrado became interested in Kung Fu. Kung Fu was starting to make a way in Hawaii and obviously across the mainland. By the 1960s, Imperato was deep, deep into the Kung Fu concepts. It got to the point where he started training uh, with Al De La Cruz and Al De Costcos and coming up with modified versions of the original hardline Kajikimbo. So now we're going to talk about Chuan Fa, Tom Pai. Those are other versions of Kajikimbo that have. Uh, Kajikimo original method ties to it, but a Kung Fu influence on it. Forms and techniques are now done differently because of the influence of Kung Fu. So my understanding is Al De La Cruz was like a catalyst to come to the mainland and help the instructors on the mainland implement this new information. And many of them were very receptive. It was something that uh, Adrian Umbrado wanted as part of his Kajikimbo. And, you know, Aldo Costco's uh, was obviously and still is a phenomenal martial artist. So his influence in showing these teachers how this goes is all part of the Kajikimbo puzzle. One of those teachers who said, I don't want to do this, was Aleo Reyes. So... My understanding is he got a hold of Adrian Umbrado and said, hey, can I just keep teaching the Kajikembo the way I learned it? And Imperato agreed. Yes, yeah, sure, you can. Why, why this is important is that Leo Reyes was his secretary for the, for the Kajikembo Self-Defense Institute. Part of his role was to write down the techniques and the forms. And I have one question. And this is going to seem uh -huh. <clears throat> this is more like a personal thing. Uh-huh. At this point in time, Aleo Reyes says, I do not want to be teaching the Kung Fu stuff, right? Yep. Early 60s. And I know you haven't mentioned this guy's name yet, but it's important to me because I'm, I'm really good friends with one of his students. Uh, Godin. Um, first name, I, I skipped something. Walter. Yeah, Walter, Walter. Godin. Walter Godin at this point has nothing to do with this Kung Fu thing, right? I'm not. I'm not an expert on the Godin stuff. I I know that would be because I, uh, I know. I don't want to. I, I, I don't, don't want to dive into the. I don't want to dive. You know what I'm trying to. You know the topic I'm trying to avoid here. But yes, there was a split. There was a split. We're not going to go into the details of what and how, but there was a split at that point. And if I'm not mistaken, he was split off at that point. Not. I mean, he's kind of there, but he's not a part of that. Any of the names you just mentioned, he's doing his own thing at this point, right? He was. Yes, he was. Okay, so it could be speculated that students of his, for example, John Hackleman, aren't going to have that Kung Fu influence because this he, there was a split before that Kung Fu stuff started even coming in with titles and all that stuff. Yes. Okay. Because that, that's for my own personal, for my own personal interest and knowledge, and also for anybody who's seen John Hackleman on my show. You can kind of see where and why you have these different ideas and philosophies coming up. Okay, so now back to your story. Alira right. I, I want. Oh, good. I want to. I want to add a little bit here. Guys like Godin trained from William Chow as well. Oh. So when you start going back to Chow or you go to Matosi, where you start learning what stuff that Imperat would have known, right? So. You also have other instructors that are around you, especially in Hawaii at that time, that are now Kung Fu instructors that are credible. So someone like Godin could have had influences from all different kinds of folks, but he also went back to Chow and he learned from Chow as well. So 
it's not going to be Kaji Kimball per se, again, unless he spent a set number of years in the Kaji Kimball world. And remember, it didn't get a name until 57. So, you know, you've got to stick around between like 55 and 58, 59 to have that, that core curriculum. Yeah. All so right. we're talking about how Aleo Reyes said he didn't want to add this, this Kung Fu influence. He wanted to just teach what he knew and what he had learned from the Imperado brothers. And he, he was the secretary of the Vikajikamo Self-Defense Institute, which meant he was a scribe. He kept everything, you know, documented. Forms go this way. The techniques go this way. So he had the curriculum from the Imperado brothers, and he just continued to teach that curriculum, right? Other schools, they implemented their own curriculums. And then um, you had folks like uh, Tony Ramos, who was trained by both Joe Imperato and Adriano Imperato, and he created the Ramos Method. Now, we don't know how much of that was Joe Imperato's influence, Adriano Imperato's influence, or Tony Ramos's influence from other sources. But he created his own method. Charles Gaylord has Gaylord method, right? You have, uh, you have these different trains of thought from the instructors, and you can't blame them or criticize them for making changes when they came up in a system that was constantly changing. And, at, you know, on Friday it was Kempo, and on Monday it was Kaji Kempo. It wasn't like something, you know, seismic happened. It was, no, we're changing the name. We're going to actually call it this now. They watched this. They lived it. They were the, they were the students. They were the guinea pigs as this was being created around them. They left and did the same exact thing. So their versions can be, you know, a lot like the Imperato Method or less than or their own thing and so forth. So some schools added the, the Kung Fu aspect to it, including the Ramos Method. It, it, we had a lot of uh, the Kung Fu influence in that system, right? And so... You have Tung Pai, which is its own group, and it's actually thriving right now. I know Tung Pai in the Pacific Northwest, they're thriving. So it's still going strong. Chuan Fa, I'm not that familiar with who's running the Chuan Fa groups anymore, but Al Dela Cruz is the king of Chuan Fa, and, and he's he's still going, he's in Hawaii, he's still going strong. So this is a little different than the original hardline stuff. It's all under the Kaji Kimbo umbrella, but it's different than the Imperato method. The Imperato method is considered to be the original hardline Kimbo version, right? The reason I believe that we're here talking today about the Imperato method is two things. Aleo Reyes saying, wait a minute, can I just keep teaching what I was teaching? And then uh, Senior Grandmaster Gary Forbeck. Uh, years back, Gary Forbach had the, the insight to bring Adrian Umperado into the fold and create videos. He was, Gary Forbach was a direct student of Leo Reyes. And he, he filmed this Imperado method knowledge with Adrian Umperado with him. And of course, Joe Davis and a group of other Kaj Kimmel guys. They put all of this curriculum on tape. Originally, it was a it was an eight track tape that became a you know a DVD, and then uh, now I believe uh, Gary Forback allows you to uh, like pay a fee or whatever and and view all the videos online. Yes. So for anybody listening right now who is interested in that, uh, if you go to if you were to go to the, the Kaju Kimbo Trading Society uh, Facebook page or even the Family Tree Kaju Kimbo Family Tree. Facebook page, and if you don't personally know Gary Forback, but you just threw up there, hey, I want to have access to the Imperial Method through Gary Forback, he is very good at responding to that. So whether it's through a DVD set or now online, um, definitely that's the best way to get access to that. All right. So that takes us up to, well, what is the curriculum, right? So for those that want to know what the Imperial Method curriculum is, 
it's 21 punch counters. It's 15 grab counters, 15 knife counters, 13 club counters, eight two-man counters. There's six three-man counters. There's one four-man counter. There's 26 advanced punch counters. Those are called the alphabets. And there are 14 Palama set forms. That's the curriculum that is considered to be the Imperato method knowledge. Uh, about, I don't know, a few years back, uh, I worked with uh, Grandmaster Joe Davis. Actually, 20 plus years ago, we created the Alphabets DVD. And we did that as a fundraiser for Adrian and Imperato and the Imperato family. And then a few years ago, we decided to film everything ourselves as well. Uh, Joe Davis and uh, Gary Forba both were direct students of Aleo Reyes. So the knowledge is very, very similar. We have a website called uh, ukfcertified.com, and you can log into that. It, there's no charge or anything like that. You just have to be a black belt in Kaji Kimbo. And then you can access these videos, and you can see all of this curriculum that we just got through talking about. It, it's all available there. So you have a couple of sources. And there are Imperato Method schools on our website. You can see the various schools. John Bishop is a Imperato Method instructor. He is a student under Gary Forbach. Um, so there are schools out there still. And the the sec, the the system itself, when you say Imperato Method Kajakimbo, it isn't that different than any of the other systems. So there's the like the Leone guys, the Ramos guys, the Gaylord guys, if they were to all sit out, Imperato Method guys with the, or the Reyes lineage, which is the Imperato Method, if they were all to sit out there uh, on the floor and do their techniques, do their forms, etc., you would be able to look at this and say, oh yeah, yeah, because it's so similar. Some of the numbers might be different, but you would be able to look at this and, and know that all of this is Kaja Kimball. And then I'm just going to make a, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to stop you right right at this point. Huh? Uh, this is actually addressing directly to the question that um, I told you. I remember I, in the beginning, I started off with someone said I wanted a deeper dive. Uh, huh? So I'm definitely going to put a shout out here to Onel Bonilla. Si mirando. If you're watching this, he's from the Puerto Rico branch. He's a black belt. You just heard Mitch say, <laughs> if you're a black belt, you can access what he just talked about as far as the Infrado method. And if you want, he, he loves doing the research and looking at different techniques and stuff. So yeah, I definitely do recommend that you do that at, one more time, the website was? It's ukfcertified.com. There it is, ukfcertified.com. And you'll have access to that in a, a, a deeper dive, like, you like, you, like yeah. you're asking for. All right, sorry, go ahead and continue. I, I probably should tell them my organization is United Kaj Kimmel Federation, thus UKF. So uh, what I was going to say is that you could set all these schools out. You could have your students out there, instructors, et cetera, and they could do punch counters, knife counters, and, and forms and so forth. It all looks similar. There might be some different moves. This group might have a few more moves, this few less. But you know what it is. So its core is Imperato Method no matter what, and there's layers on it. You can see that. What's sad is that there are there are too many schools, especially uh, abroad, that use the Kaji Kimmel name and do not do anything that looks like Kaji Kimmel's curriculum. They might be, you know, grappling on the ground and, and point fighting and putting it all together, and you end up with, you know, Jim Jones's method. But when you set it next to a Gaylord school, a Leone school, a Ramos school, Array of school, and you look at what they're doing, you have no idea what this this person's doing. It doesn't look like anything that's Kajikimo related as far as the techniques, as far as the forms. So um, there are valid schools out there in all of these lines. Everyone just needs to do their research. Now, your, your, uh, your person asked you a question uh, is one better than the other one, right? And I'm going to say this is a really easy question to answer. It is, and it's it surprises me that people struggle so much with trying to answer this. Yes, 
there's clearly one method better than the other. There's clearly one style better than the other. And the answer is this. Wherever you train, your teacher's the best. Whatever style you're training in, it's the best style ever in the history of the known world, right? And whatever version of Kajikimo you train in, that is the best ever. As sarcastic as all of that sounds, it's so true. You know, you sit there and have a conversation with somebody and you're talking about, you know, this martial art. That The first thing you want to do is puff their chest and say, oh, mine's better. My teacher's better. My art's better, right? I am versed in both Imperato Method and Ramos Method Kajikimbo. I've been doing this almost 50 years. And when you set them down side by side, they do the same things. You block, you punch, you kick, you take down, you control. They all do the same and similar things. And what I think is always the missing link is that when Kajikimo was created, it was created based on concepts, not techniques. The techniques were created from the concepts. So when I learned the alphabet techniques from Joe Davis back in, you know, you know, 20, 25 years ago, right? I wrote to Adrian Imperato and I said, see, si, Joe. I learned these alphabet techniques. Where do they come from? You know, tell me about them. And he wrote back to me. And uh, I have his, I have it, this letter right here, which you probably can or cannot see. I don't know. This is his writing. This is what he said. And I think this is important because if you want to understand Kaji Kimball, you might want to know what the creator thought when he was making these techniques. He said, creating the techniques was simple. All you had to do was to use speed, applying the right type of blows, damaging the vital areas on the body, such as the groin, the throat, the side of the neck, the back of the neck, the eyes, the temple, and so on. When he did a technique, he would stun the attacker's punching arm, and then he would implement one of these movements. He would strike or attack the attacker somewhere in one of these vital areas. And then depending on his need, he would either bounce them or take them down and control them. If he felt like he needed to, to strike and kick and move them out of the way, that's one thing. If he felt like he needed to take them to the ground and control them, that's something else. So when you think about what version is better, I'm going to say... As long as you're learning the concepts between, you know, stand up, ground, and controlling your, your various attacker or multiple attackers and dealing with fighting, you know, against weapons and so forth, you're probably going to learn what you're going to learn in every school. If you train one day a week, you're not going to learn as much as if you train two or three or four days a week. And if you train for one year from this guy and then a year from that guy and one year over here, it, there's a possibility that you're going to miss a lot of stuff. So, you know, is there one style better? How about are you better than the other people that are training? And are you better today than you were yesterday? How much are you willing to put into this? So. The Imperato method is the old Kempo Karate version of what the Imperato folks were teaching. It's watered down as it moves through the generations. The farther you get away from Hawaii in the 1950s and that core group of instructors, the higher probability you're not going to be learning what they were teaching. And then there was someone asked about the Garcia method. Right. That was that same gentleman asked about Garcia method. So uh, I'm familiar with Angel Garcia. Uh, I've known him for many, many years. So when I first saw his version of Kaji Kimbo, I thought maybe I had missed something. Because it was very, very different. And I was asking all the folks that I trained with about it. And they said, yeah, I don't know, man. He's over in Spain and, and maybe that's how they do it over there. And then we learned that. He was a student of Ed Shepard's. And I thought, well, maybe Ed Shepard taught that way. 
for the longest time, uh, really didn't have any answer to it. And then if you look at the various martial arts that Angel Garcia has trained in, you'll see that he has a lot of other influences. So he created his own method, like many folks did, by putting his other martial arts influences in one pot. And that, that brings me to something I was going to mention earlier. Because at this point, maybe some people are asking, well, you know, if you know the Kajikimbo historian, why didn't you just ask him to do one podcast to cover all everything? And the reason I didn't do that, and this is a question nobody asked me, but this is something that maybe someone's asking themselves. And this is something that I asked myself before I moved forward to answer this question. It would have been really easy just to have Mitch come in right off the bat, who's got all the records, to break it down and give you all the information. But for anyone following this series, the reason I'm grabbing people that actually do the method to explain it is so that you can see, literally see, how as time passes, people will grab the information coming in and how they translate it from their perspective when they receive whatever they're taught in by whoever they're taught. Like he just, like Mitch was just saying about, well, my instructor might, might make the technique work. Well, someone asked me this the other day, how do I, well, what if, Punch number one, what if the guy grabs me like this? And what am I supposed to do if this doesn't work? I mean, you make it work. <laughs> well, you, you need to understand the concepts understand behind the concept, what you're but, doing. But you need to make it work. Like, that's one of the primary things that I'm telling them is if, if it's not working, then you're doing something wrong and you need to make it work. Like, it's there's no if, ands, or buts about this. But well, 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 what's, well, what's the takedown? It's the takedown that works. I, I'm, sure, you know, I'm going to show you several takedowns. But what about a take? There's never a one size fits all takedown for how big is your attack? Right. So again, without going into a big old philosophy, how this works out, the reason I grabbed a bunch of different people from the different methods that experienced a method to explain this, and I didn't just use Mitch because Mitch has all the, he's got all the history. As you can see, um, he's got all the history and documentation of how it went forward was because I think it's kind of like a, a real-time explanation to not only now you can grab what Mitch said with the history and then you can go back to those other interviews but if you've already heard those other interviews you'll see why they are seeing things or saying things because I did interview a, a, a Garcia guy and he was just and if you saw that episode you'll see what he was saying, like, so you just said, like, you know, the, the movements, the influence, he said the same, he said, this, now we already see a connection right here. He was using yeah. the influences that he had from his experiences out in Europe, which is, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, sorry. Go well, ahead, go ahead. You know, there, there's just certain areas uh, around the world where watch them train and they hit each other much, much harder than people do in other areas. You can go into a martial arts school and you can watch people train and you realize that they're having a great time there. It's very social. Everybody enjoys where they're at and being there. But you're not seeing anybody get lit up. And then you'll go to other schools and you'll see everybody get lit up. You can't learn Kaji Kembo if you don't get hurt. C. Joe used to say, make pain your friend. Right. And then it won't bother you when it happens. I can't, you know, I just had another dental surgery done for more implants because I've broken most of my teeth completely off the of bone, right? From getting hit in the face, elbows and knees and stuff like that. You will get hurt if you do it, even when you pad up. But there's a pro and a con to the pad. Part of the con, the, the con is that you don't feel the pain. You have to get hurt. You have to know what it's like to not have any air, to get bruised ribs or, you know, get get knocked down, flipped and dropped on your neck so hard you can't bend your head for a month. That's all part of the training that teaches you how to share it with somebody else. And it cannot be you're fighting, you're 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 training to to, you know, just destroy somebody. You can't learn that without doing that. And and again, like. And we're getting close to the wrap up here, but see, so half of this tooth is fake. And what I want to say is this doesn't even, some of you listening might be thinking, oh, this is happening. Like, oh, they're like sparring really hard. I've gotten more hurt being an uke 
And it's not even <laughs> I've got more hurt being a trading partner, and not even for a black belt. Okay, I've gotten more hurt training a student, <laughs> showing them the technique on how they're supposed to do it. I've got that's how I lost half this too. It was a uh, it was one of our one of our senior students. He was a brown belt. I'm pretty sure he was he must he was he was one of our older students in the class. He must have been at the time, and maybe. I was like 20 something and he was like 50. He was, he was definitely over 50. And, uh, and I forgot, I, don't, I can't even remember how it happened, but we were going over one of the punch counters and, um, and he, he kind of moved uh, in a way that I didn't see coming. And he ended up doing a reverse elbow. That was not part of, not part of the original <laughs> technique that we showed. And I got popped in the mouth and lost half a tooth. So, <laughs> but that's and you know, that's just part of you know. And, and and class continued. You know, I I picked up what was left in my tooth, and this is just the kind of stuff that happens. I just want to clarify. Some people might think, oh, this is happening during the sparring. No, this is just when you're working these kinds of techniques, these kind of techniques that um. And we're not even trying to hurt each other. It's just when you're working these kind of techniques that are going for vital shots. This kind of stuff just happens. It's it's not a question of when, of if; it's more of a question of, of when. So, <laughs> when, when we were filming the uh, videos that they'll see on the UKF website, uh, the punch counter videos and so forth, Dennis Peterson, uh, he's a senior professor with our group. Uh, he was one of the Yukis, and we, we had to film all this within a certain amount of time because we have. You know, we got Joe Davis with us and, you know, we don't we want to take all this time. We want to make sure that we're doing it all right. And so we're filming this. We get done and I could tell Dennis was not not loving life. And like the next day or the day after that, he he's in the hospital. He's got bruised ribs, bruised sternum and all this stuff. Angela, we weren't doing anything that we wouldn't normally have done in our regular training. The difference here is we had filmed about 55 techniques, and sometimes you got to film them more than once because it, it doesn't, the angles aren't right and so forth. So poor Dennis probably got a hundred techniques done on him that day. And and you know, I still feel bad about it. It 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 jacked him up really bad, but that's how the art is. And had we flipped the script, if Dennis was doing the techniques on me, then I would have been the guy getting lumped up and, and you know, going to the hospital and stuff. If you walk out of your class, you know, day after day, week after week, whatever you're doing, and there's no aches and pains, it's a great social place to be. But I guarantee you're not learning martial arts. Just doesn't work that way. You can't go from there to some guy trying to attack you in a parking lot at the Walmart and say, oh, yeah, I. I know exactly what to do and I can do it. It's just, you, there's no switch to flip like that. It doesn't work that way. Well, we are close to our wrap up here. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of the wrap up questions that I've been asking all the other people, uh, I've, since you've been on the show before, I've asked you that question before. And on top of that, um, you had such a good explanation. I really don't have a wrap up question for you. You kind of just, just really did a, you know, you, you, you answered the, some of the rapid questions I asked the other guys, you put it right into the interview. So, um, for our wrap up question, let's see here. Pop cultural, pop cultural question, not relevant to anything. Kaja Kembo, who would win in a fight between, between, Okay, fictional characters, uh, let's say Batman and Iron Man. Who do you think would win in a fight between Batman and Iron Man? And why? And then we'll wrap up with that. Well, when I was a kid, Batman was Adam West. And he didn't look too tough to me. So I'm going to say Iron Man. Uh, you know, I remember the Green Hornet and Kato trying to fight Batman and Robin. And I thought poor Robin was going to his pants when Kato said it's you know you're my guy let's go um yeah I'm not a fan of uh Batman or his sidekick all right I'll go, so with, here. I'll go with I'll go with D any of the above <laughs> so there you go <laughs> all right Mitch thank you so much for coming out right, and Angel. talking to me for you uh for all my listeners and followers and viewers thank you so much for supporting social Dilla with angelo podcast uh if you like what you heard share with your friends and as you can see if you ask me questions whether it's in the comments or whether you email me or however i do address them 
So feel free to ask. Catch y'all next time.